Boy, have we, uh, we've been through it recently in this church. Been through some heavy times. We've had faithful friends leave us to be with Jesus. We've struggled with sickness. We've endured health scares. Our very own pastor did not escape such challenges. I see him hiding in the back. I was halfway hoping he'd be in hospital slippers or a big plastic bubble. But my household, like many of yours, did not escape this. We had one of the worst viruses I can remember since, uh, since I got the swine flu a number of years ago. Uh, remember that, swine flu? You know, it did not have anything to do with what I do for a living. In case any of you are waiting to crack that joke, nothing to do with it. Long story short, it's been a rough spot. Enough to test tempers stretch our capacity for forgiveness, and even shake some faith. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've all likely had moments where we had shaken faith syndrome. After all, we're trapped in these broken, sinful sacks of flesh. We will fail, even amidst our most noble pursuit of faith. And that's what I want us to consider this morning. In our moments of shaken faith, we inevitably wonder, whether explicitly or just in the back of our minds, is my faith reasonable? What am I doing? Am I right to be mocked for my faith? What proof do I have? And that's this morning's message is titled, Is Faith Reasonable? So let's stand real quick for the reading of this morning's passage. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, right before 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read verses 3 through 8. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen also by me as by one born out of due time. Let's pray. God, we want to hear from you this morning. We want to hear about what you have to say about faith, about what it means to us, what we can rely on. We want you to steer us clear of any faith crises. Most of all, God, we want you to be glorified this morning. We want to be fed by your word. We want you to... Just breathe your life into this church through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Unless you want to stand the whole time, that's fine too. I'm going to stand. Now, why did I choose to look at this section of scripture and then talk about, is faith reasonable? Pastor Mike, this passage is about the Apostle Paul trying to convince the church in Corinth about the resurrection of Christ, which, by the way, some of them flat out still denied. True, but it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. What is a lack of faith? What are we looking at in those moments? What are we looking for? Proof, right? Proof. We're preconditioned to require proof before we invest our faith into something. The thing is, we have proof, even by today's legalistic standards. When people say Christians have blind faith in a fairy tale father in the sky, verses like 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 rush to the defense. This verse has the gospel and a historical account of the risen. Christ, all in a concise little package. There are many verses like it. I just 
chose to focus on this one this week. But here come the naysayers, right? The Bible story was written by men. So I guess it isn't factual and it can't be trusted. Case closed, right? By that logic, I guess we can ignore all the other ancient manuscripts and documented history with that same premise. They were written by man. Plato, Aristotle, Archimedes, Pythagoras, Socrates. It's like a college course in here, huh? Those accounts are phony too. Made up dribble, written by men. But hey, that Nostradamus guy, spot on. Media loves that guy. Let's report on everything he had to say. But it's funny, right? How humans have selective acceptance on what they choose to believe. Humanity can choose to accept the observations and accounts of some historical figures, but for a large portion of society, if it came out of the Bible, we're in fantasy land. True, our beliefs require that we have faith in things we ourselves did not see. That's true. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So our faith itself is evidence of that which we place it in. Kind of a circular argument until you dig deeper. But what about this proof that we inherently desire? This proof before we invest our faith. And if we saw proof of everything would we still even believe? Well, for many who personally saw Christ in action in his human form, they still didn't believe, and they saw it. And if we saw proof of everything, would it even be a matter of faith at all? An important question, because faith is the only way by which we can be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not by of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's by faith. So if we see everything, and it's right in front of us, is that even a matter of faith? And then can we be saved by it? So if we eliminate the need for faith by copious, bulletproof, technicolor, courtroom-vetted evidence, we've destroyed our path to God. Weird to think of that, right? How many of you prayed, God, just show me. Show me this. Show me that. I was a little kid, I remember. And I used to pray. And this is, I went to a Christian school for two years in my life. I don't consider myself saved at that point because I didn't really know what that meant. But I would pray. I would say, God, if you're real, in the morning, ready for this, make the cushions on the couch be on the floor. Weird, right? I wanted proof. I wanted proof. But God gifted us with the ability to have faith so that we could be saved, as we just read. Not only the ability to have faith, but he's given us the object in which to place our faith, Jesus, and plenty of reasons for us to place it. He knows our temporal human perspective cannot see everything that he's ever done. Never enough, uh, enough for us to say, yep, there's all the physical proof right there. He knows he, we can't do that. So as a gift, he created the path to salvation through faith. The ability to have faith is a gift from God. And the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, the new covenant, is a greater gift still. Our act of faith is an act of trust. And it's pleasing to God. And subsequently, it's all he asks of us. He doesn't want us to believe just because the facts are all neatly laid out right in front of us. He wants us to believe because he asked us to. Nevertheless, he actually did leave us proof. See our verse from this morning. 
So this morning, we're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about blind faith. We're going to talk about reasonable faith. And we're going to talk about having faith regardless of your circumstance. And like the Corinthians, it's good to get a reminder of this stuff because the Corinthians, who denied the resurrection, they weren't unbelievers. They credited themselves Christians. And yet they still suffered from major doubt. So point number one this morning, which is on the Megatrons, is we're going to talk about blind faith. If you think about it, there's many things we place our blind faith in. That the food we buy is okay to eat. The water from your tap is okay to drink. That your car will start. That the car behind you will stop before it hits you. Blind faith. The dulling down of our natural born inquisitive skepticism through repetition. Buy food, eat food, don't die. Buy food, eat food, don't die. Fill up the cup, drink the water, didn't die. Do it again? Yeah, that's proof. Put my faith in it. But that's not blind faith. Someone with a scientific mind will say, look at all that proof. Look at all that proof, that repetition, those results. Proof of what? The results of that repetition? Stay with me now. Unless you oversee all the steps that food takes to get to your table and in your mouth, and that water travels to get into your glass and into your mouth, where's the proof that it's safe before we ingest it? We're relying on the historical results of our experiences, right? We don't see all those steps. And we're okay with that, apparently. We're okay with that. Funnier still, we rely on the USDA to tell us what's safe to eat and drink. And since we can't oversee and confirm all aspects of the food and water getting to us, we let the government tell us what's safe. And guess what? We place our blind faith in them. And God asks the same of us to a degree. He's even given us historical, scriptural accounts as to why we should have faith and the results of not having it. The Bible is full of them. Again, this morning's passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. I'm going to read it again because it's one is to get lodged in your melon. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Right there he's saying, I'm a witness. I received it. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Calling upon the historical, historical accounts of scripture. And that he was buried. And that he rose on the third day according to scriptures. But he doesn't stop there. And that he was seen by Cephas. Witness number one. Then by the twelve. Thirteen, right? We're at thirteen. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, some of whom are still alive, he says here. And then by James, and then by Paul himself. After the apostles. What is that? My goodness, that's witness accounts. Paul laid out hundreds of verified secondhand accounts of those who saw Jesus after he rose from death. And as he said, some of those witnesses were still alive, so they could leave Paul's little gathering and go ask him. Indeed. Paul also proclaims his own firsthand experience, meeting the resurrected Christ. It's one thing to say, hey, my buddy over there said he saw Christ. It's another thing to say, I met him on the road to Damascus. He laid out the same kind of witness account that one would produce in a courtroom. Because when a judge or a jury hears evidence, they have to decide on the validity of that evidence, even though they weren't there to witness it themselves. That's what the question of faith is. We've been given accounts in God's word, and we have to individually decide if we have faith in that evidence, 
even though we weren't there to personally witness it. What the naysayers call blind faith. A hilarious double standard. But the results of our decisions in this arena, they hold eternal weight. We're not talking about a courtroom. We're talking about the eternal courtroom. The fact is, we cannot, and we aren't, ourselves Christians. We cannot call ourselves that if we do not have faith. Again, I invoke Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Well, what about the unsaved? Those who have not made that decision, their choice to place their faith in Jesus. Now that is a great question, and that's a discussion about opportunity, evangelism, and seed planting. A great question, but a different discussion than what we're going to have this morning. We're going to touch on it briefly, though. I'm talking specifically to us right now, saved Christians. And if anybody has questions about that or about if they are saved, let's have a conversation today after church. Don't be bashful. Come up and talk to me or Pastor Pat. He's sitting in the back there taking notes. Note number one, why did I let him speak from the pulpit? God does not ask us to have blind faith. Blind faith uh, faith is like taking something for granted. And I don't think God wants that kind of faith in him. It's insulting. We have faith for what he did, why he did it, and what he promises to do. Not because we just suddenly decide to have that faith. We have historical evidence. We see changed lives. We feel his presence and our own changed lives. What about the proof? Well, I just gave you some. But also, we lean on many things one of which are more historical accounts that detail the resurrected Christ. Like the list I provided for you on the left. We have our verse this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. All the major gospels, Matthew 28, 1 through 20, Mark 16, 1 through 20, Luke 24, 1 through 53, John 20, 1 through 31, 1 Peter 1, 3. These aren't fairy tales. These are historical accounts of the witnessed resurrected Christ. Christians have blind faith in God. That's nonsense. By that sentiment, we'd have to ignore these numerous historical accounts, many now supported by modern-day archaeological discoveries. We'd have to ignore the over 300 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus, documented in Scripture, and we'd have to ignore the changed lives we've witnessed all around us, including our own. And even if we did ignore all that proof of the creator, creation itself reveals him to us. Luke 19, 39 and 40 say, And some of the Pharisees called to him, Jesus, from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, the sky above, shows his handiwork. Job 12.7-9, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And in Romans 1.20, again, Paul speaking, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Creation screams at us about the Creator. So even if you aren't, or someone doesn't have the benefit of a physical Bible, creation screaming at them. No, God doesn't ask us to have blind faith. But he does ask us to have faith in things we ourselves did not witness, based on the evidence and accounts he left for us in his word. So you're going to be asked, is that reasonable? Is that unreasonable? Brings me to point number two, reasonable faith. Is having this kind of faith, regardless of personally witnessing something, regardless of circumstance, is that a reasonable request? Well, let's take a look at some examples of what is reasonable and what is not. Is it reasonable for someone, not naming names, but it's me, to get into a fist fight over the last chocolate donut? Most would say no. I would say it depends. (laughs) Is it reasonable that when you're driving behind someone who's crawling well below the speed limit, that you speed up and pull up next to them just to get a look at them to see who did they trick DMV into giving them their license? Is that reasonable? Again, it depends. Is it reasonable that after being presented with the best gift you could ever possibly imagine, a gift you don't deserve, have to earn, or ever have to repay, you would turn it down? Is that reasonable? What makes this scenario even weirder is that we have historical accounts. I've been hammering that. We have historical accounts like this morning's scripture, documenting Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the very foundation of our faith. And we can look to those for details, for direction, for evidence. But some still turn the gift of salvation down. And that, to me, is unreasonable and downright contrarian. It's like rejecting something for the sake of rejecting it. Refusing to accept historical scriptural proof because it doesn't align with a worldview. Attacking the source, the Bible, as a man-made fiction, though not ever bothering to look into it. Or realize the incredible double standard that that presents. It's like when Morpheus gave the choice to Neo in The Matrix right? What? Uh, It's either too long ago. No, it's 1999. It's not that long ago. It's okay. That was a a huge metaphor for Savior, by the way, just so you know. Anyways, Morpheus, getting back to the point. But it's a greater choice even still that we're given. Accept the free gift of eternal salvation. All you need is faith and the ability to receive and independently accept that proof that's laid out for us. Refuse that gift of salvation and take your chances. Because, help me out here, because, I mean, why would somebody, bless you, why would somebody walk away from that opportunity, that gift? For me, for many years, it came down to pride. and not recognizing my need. We humans, how many of you are not humans? We humans will constantly tell you that we have a hard time putting our faith in something, especially if we haven't seen it. We need hard evidence. Our actions speak to a different truth, though. We constantly put our faith in things absent proof. Individuals, society, governments, companies, without seeing direct evidence of their true intentions, 
their operation or the responsibility of their tax dollars. What trust we just throw around. Think about it. Yet we still risk to have doubts about our faith. Excuse me. Truth be told, there's many reasons why people think faith in God's gospel is unreasonable. All of them temporal and attached to circumstance. We can't see past our temporary circumstances, how we were raised, where we live, how much hardship we've endured or are enduring. And our modern predisposition, our default setting, tells us that we need to see hard evidence of everything. Remember what I said earlier, faith placed only after seeing indisputable proof isn't faith at all, is it? Worse yet, some have developed negative associations with Christianity because of us. Because humans and human-created religion have perverted the message, thus preventing some from wanting to put their faith in God because they associate it with the fallen man. Their association to God is rooted in their negative experience of mankind, and they find it unreasonable to place their faith in man-made religion. Imagine walking into a church, and some guy or gal runs up on you with a headset, with a headset and a clipboard. Welcome to Ultra Super Mega Church Point Five. You're new here. Our valet, our valet, spotted you in the parking lot. Uh, welcome. Here's a couple of pointers. Make sure you get here before 10.05, because that's when we're just about down to the last donut. And that guy, Mike, he will fist fight you for it. Legitimately fist fight you. Also, your membership is due on the first of the month. Uh, you're expected to tithe above and beyond that membership, by the way. We keep track. And now that you're here, you'll need permission from the pastor to get married, divorced, paint your house, It's standard business, but you'll need to submit your requests well in advance because the pastor spends a lot of time in his vacation villas throughout the year, so he books up quick. And also, if you're not in a suit and tie or a dress for the ladies, you're going to have to sit in the gallery. See that? That's the gallery up there. Or you can attend our services online. We still expect you to tithe. (laughs) Lastly, no eye contact with the pastor, please, as he emerges from the smoke. Got it? Great. You may now worship the Lord, cue the smoke machine, go get that donut. That's an operation. That's an operation. I've been to some big churches where you haven't set your second foot in the door and someone's throwing a t-shirt at you. Welcome! Welcome! Join us! And it's all in, we get it. We get why they're doing it. And it's overwhelming. And severely, sometimes that perverts Christ's church, the point of it. With Christ, it's never about the building. It's never about the order of service, about what we wear, about who you sit next to, about a a pastor giving permission for anything. The veil is torn, people. It's always been about a personal relationship through faith. And yet humanity, whether maliciously or naturally through our fallen state, we've seen fit to pervert that, try to make it better. Tower of Babel, anyone? Those reservations aside, what have we to lose by taking a leap in faith and accepting the gospel for its truth? Nothing. What have we to gain? Everything. Everything. If we Christians are wrong, no harm, no foul, you're back where you started. But if we're right, and we are, there's literal hell to pay. Taking that chance seems unreasonable. The only danger about faith is when we don't have it. So taking a step in faith to secure your eternal salvation 
seems quite reasonable, especially in light of the accounts we were given in Scripture. It is, in fact, reasonable to greatly consider those historical accounts of Jesus and his resurrection, and thus to consider having faith in him. It is unreasonable to ignore those accounts based on bias, ignorance, fear. I rest my case. Point number three. Faith regardless. I think, I hope, we've established this morning that we do not hold a blind faith in God. And I think we've established, I hope, that our faith in God is reasonable. What about having faith regardless? God asks us to have faith regardless, regardless of what we're going through, because of what we're going through, in spite of what we're going through. It's another tough idea and a bellwether for a person's faith. Is it reasonable for God to ask out of us to have faith in him regardless of our circumstances? Remembering that circumstance I mentioned is often the reason people reject the gospel entirely. Is it unreasonable for God to ask this? Remember the witness accounts laid out in this morning's scripture? Over 500 of them. I would offer again that it is unreasonable with everything available to us in Scripture that we would let our faith falter in any circumstance. Strong words, Pastor Mike. You haven't been through what I've been through. You're not married to Pastor Pat like I am. Maybe not. But we do need to experience, rewind, let's form this as a question. Do we need to experience all manner of suffering to understand a core principle of faith? That the object of our faith, God, is greater than any circumstance and that he never falters. And that he did, in fact, allow our spiritual ancestors to document his moments of revelation, his death, his resurrection. Of course, we don't need to experience all manner of sufferings to acknowledge that. Doctrinal truths, and it's on the board on the bottom. I said the board like I'm a teacher. Doctrinal truths are true, independent of our suffering, of our challenges, of our momentary distress. Even so, again, there are many examples to look to from Scripture of people having faith regardless of their dire situations. Now, you may have seen these examples in your present life with some people that are just heroes in the faith now, and that's no less valid. But I want to point to the historical documented accounts in the Bible, the evidence. Genesis 22, 1 through 19, our buddy Abraham father of the faith, having faith in God enough to nearly sacrifice his son Isaac because he was asked to. That's a pretty dire circumstance, I would think. When Isaac, probably a little suspicious, asks, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Now, this is either an example of Abraham flat out lying to his son or a display of pure faith in God. Well, we know that it's faith. How do we know that? Because earlier in Genesis 15, 6, we're told, and he, Abraham, Abram at the time, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Would a righteous person with faith lie to his son? How about the book of Job, the entire book of Job? Job losing everything and yet still maintaining his steadfast faith in God, regardless of circumstance. How about 2 Samuel 12, King David? After his many sins, adultery, murder by proxy, you know, nothing major, his son dies. But throughout his son's illness, 
with his sins in mind. He knows very well what he's done. He prayed and fasted, showing his faith in God's ability to heal should he want to. Even when his son died, David displayed his faith in God's salvation, knowing that it was still an option for him. I will go to him, his son. He will not come to me. Isn't that beautiful? The ultimate faith in the end product, regardless of everything that already happened. And then, of course, directly from our scripture this morning, Paul cites the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There were many moments in that timeline where Christ was called to have faith, regardless of his dire, impending circumstances. Look at Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Here, Christ, wrought with grief and the fear burbling inside that human form, he experiences despair. He asks the Father, Oh, my Father, is it, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Here, facing torture and death is a perfect moment to despair and have a crisis in faith. But Jesus doesn't stop there in his despair. He finishes with, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I would hope that's part of your prayers every time you pray. We get caught up in the please and thank yous and mostly pleases and what I want, what I need. How about, however, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Let that be the end bookmark of your prayers. Christ placed his ultimate faith in God for his perfect will, despite the dire circumstance before him. Faith regardless. In a great breakdown of faith in your uh, spare time this afternoon, Hebrews uh, 11. Thumb through that chapter. That is an excellent chapter. There's way too much to dive into this morning. I'm just going to leave it there. It's a great example of heroes in the faith, the results of the having that faith. It's a great little synopsis. So please, Hebrews 11, that's your homework. I will say, we must remember that when we falter, not if, when, when we are weak, not if, when, and when we need the most, that's when God is the most effective. He's the only one who can reach us in the depths of our despair. Louis, I almost said pit of despair, but I decided not to. Pit of despair, anyone? No? Okay. Princess Bride. All right. God is the most effective when we're in the depths of our despair. That's not the time to question our faith. It's the time to lean in. To embrace it. Do the full lean. Do the full Michael Jackson smooth criminal lean. Right into it. That's the time to lean in. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Not his weakness, our weakness. Paul also said in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Faith. This is coming from a fella, Paul, that had his share of suffering. Many a time Paul could have lost faith, but he pressed forward. He leaned in. If anyone had an excuse to lose faith, it was Paul, but he had faith regardless. God doesn't tell us that when times are tough to just give up on faith. No, faith can actually thrive in the darkest of hours, and it will. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. 
Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. A faith-centric verse. So I ask you, is faith reasonable? Is it reasonable? The answer to this becomes much more clear when we offer the reverse of that question. Is it reasonable to live without faith? Of course not. I already told you we're doing it all the time. People throw their unsolicited and sloppy faith at anything these days. I'm going to make that yellow light. Right? Yeah, the milk's probably still good. Right? Looks like that bridge will hold up just fine. Of course it's not reasonable to live without faith. Otherwise, humans would require a thorough factual breakdown of every element of society before making any decision. So why do some refuse to place their faith in something, someone, who offers salvation? It comes down to state of heart and recognition of need. That's where the church comes in. Where we look for that opportunity to reveal everyone's need for a savior. Where we plant those seeds of gold in fertile soil. That's what I'm talking about. I said we touch on evangelism and that's what we're touching on. This is our job. Despair is contagious. But so is faith. Not blind faith, not unreasonable faith, but faith in historical accounts of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith that the change we experienced when we were saved wasn't just a fever dream. That we didn't just will it and all of a sudden became changed. That it was God in us. Faith that no matter the circumstances, no matter the doom and gloom coming at us every day, we are his. And he has overcome the world, as stated in John 16, 33. So, when others ask you how you can blindly believe in the unreasonable and made-up story of God... Don't be thrown. Don't second guess your faith. Don't get angry. Point to the factual accounts in the historical document we know as the Bible. Just like this morning's verse, over 500 witness accounts. Embrace your testimony. Nobody can take that away from you. It's up to them, the others that ask that question, it's up to them at that point, through God's will, to take that step in faith. 